Hey, buddy. Hi. <laughs> it's that time of year. It's gonna be, this is gonna be a rough video. I feel like I've spent seven months working my way to get to the point where I can do this video and like even doing it, like I think it's gonna be hard. So, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Kitchen and Jordan Show. <laughs> welcome to the Kitchen and Jordan Show and welcome to a time honored BuzzFeed tradition the why we left BuzzFeed video. I should mention at the top, there are some trigger warnings here for suicidal ideation. Yeah. So it's gonna be that kind of video. Yeah. Toot toot. Toot toot, beep, yeah. Beep. Honestly, this is a video that I feel like I need to make just because I feel like it would be important for me to have closure and it's important for me to have catharsis here. Talking about my experiences is probably the best way for me to feel that way. Yeah. And I will say that like, we are taking a risk here. It's possible people are gonna be like, we don't give a shit. Yeah, and but if that's how you feel, you just don't have to watch it. Yeah, you don't have to watch, you can click out. We have lots of other videos. So first things first, uh, obviously I am like a white, queer, fat woman. And so my experiences at BuzzFeed are going to be through that lens. Obviously a lot of the stuff I'm about to talk about is not like particularly rosy. Other people have had different and in a lot of ways worse experiences than me and you should listen to them. Yeah. We just want to like start off this video by recognizing like the fact that we can make this video, that we have like the energy to make this video, it's coming from like a place of privilege. That we have the resources to make this video, it's no. coming from a place of privilege. We recognize that and so it's like there are people that are going to be talking about their experiences or things they've gone through and their voices are valid, listen to them, and we're just sort of contributing so you know where we come from. The fact that we can make a video like this and it won't ruin our careers is also a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that um, this is a story about Jen and I. Yeah. It's not the story of Ladylike. Mm -hmm. There is a lot that intersects those two stories, uh, but the story of Ladylike is a story that like all five of us should tell, and it's yeah. not a story for the two of us to tell. Yeah. So there are some things in this story that are gonna be left out. You probably may be able to fill in some of the gaps, but I will not be filling in those gaps for you. Mm -mm. So the third thing is that with all companies, culture is set at the top. This is every company. I worked at BuzzFeed for six and a half years. You worked there for four? Five. Five. Yeah. Yeah, see, we don't even know. Yeah. Time is just, you know, yeah. not real. And whenever we heard that someone was coming out with a why I left BuzzFeed video, uh, we would be like, oh man. Yeah, and that's not because we like felt like they shouldn't make those videos or yeah. because they were saying things that weren't true. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that would happen is like people would watch those videos and they would get upset rightfully. But the people that would get affected by those videos were not the people at the top setting the culture. It would be the people like mid-level employees, lower level people, employees, people producers, make, like people making content were the ones that were yeah. sort of getting the fallback and the pushback from those videos because they're the ones that are visible. People will get mad at BuzzFeed and then just not look at the videos being made by people who work at BuzzFeed who honestly don't have a lot of power. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that if you love creators at BuzzFeed, the best thing that you can do to help support them is to watch their videos yeah. and like follow their Instagrams and their Twitters and their TikToks because having a huge base of support and proven numbers gives people the resources and the confidence to leave. If your response to this is, I'm not gonna watch those videos, like you're actually gonna hurt people that we care about and that who want to have a career after this company. For like as much frustration as we may have towards like our former employer, like that doesn't mean that people work who work there are bad people and that you shouldn't support them. Like I still watch BuzzFeed videos because yeah. like I still like people that make content there and they make good things. Being able to quit your job is a privilege. Yeah. In order to kind of acquire resources, acquire like enough of an audience in order to make the break, you you need a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so the fact that like we were able to quit is a privilege. Yeah. So like you shouldn't look at people and be like, you still work at BuzzFeed, why? It's like having a media job is a big deal. Yeah. That's health insurance, that's stability, that's your rent, especially right now. They wanna make stuff that makes you happy. So like, yeah. they, they love you, so please love them. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing I wanna say is like, I was at this company for six and a half years. I love this company. I love being there, I love the people. The people are actually the part that keep you there very long. Yeah. Because it's like, what are you, what are you gonna do? Leave your, leave your friends? No. No, never. It's like, that. that's the part that really- I mean, we you. didn't. Yeah, I know. We, we didn't we, leave we, our we, friends. We, we, like, our, we took our friends with yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> so 
<laughs> we, we actually circle not all our friends. We still have friends there. Yeah, we still have friends there. It's, it was a hard company to leave. Like I, I loved my job and I gave my job everything. Yeah. This is coming from a place of, I think, a deep sense of hurt that some place that I loved so much did not love me in return. Yeah. That's the preambles to my story. Yeah. Is it time to begin the story? I think so. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna tell the story of when it started to really go downhill for me. Yeah. Starting in like mid 2016, early 2017, is when we really got put on like a treadmill. We were releasing like two videos, sometimes three videos a week. And if we didn't get that many videos out, it was just like more videos. It really started when we started the channel. Yeah. And kind of the idea was that we would work really hard on this channel for a year and then magic thing would happen or whatever. I don't even know. Like either we'd get paid more, get more resources or whatever. Um, so that's kind of going on in the background. I would say like VidCon 2018 is probably when like the suicidal ideation really started for me because we were kind of in a situation where we were just going, 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 and it was like, to what end? The way that like we were sort of working on Ladylike was that there were there was like pretty high quotas, and so that meant that you had to be filming a lot, mm -hmm. and you had to be coming up with new ideas, and new content had to be put out. And so those demands kind of were rising as time went on, mm -hmm. but the amount of resources that we were allotted and the amount of faith that it seemed like leaders at the company had in us really seemed to go downhill. So you're sort of in a situation where mm -hmm. a lot is being asked of you and it sort of feels like the end goal keeps moving further and further away. I would say like the second night of VidCon, I was just like, maybe I just don't want to be alive anymore. I am here at this convention. I'm here at the thing that I'm that I'm supposed to have aspired to and I am not happy. I am barely hanging on. I don't know whether or not this is ever gonna stop. And I know that I have $2,000 in my bank account. So it's not like I can just leave. If I didn't have any sort of prospects or plans, and I also didn't really have the energy to create those because I was so tired. Yeah. I was going through my notes in preparation for this video. Uh, and I found something that I, I wrote. This was this was December 2018. Um, it's like six months after VidCon. Six months after VidCon. I remember I was upset one day and I just kind of locked myself in a conference room and I just was like, I need to write out my thoughts. I need to give answers about insert project here. I need to give answers about insert project here. Uh, my keys are missing. I'm not packed. My house is a mess. I haven't done laundry. I don't have the energy to shoot. Every time someone says to me, I know you're working hard. I just want to throw them in a lake. I'm treading water, I'm drowning. How am I supposed to be inspirational? Is this even fun to watch? Am I even fun? I hate myself, I hate my voice, I hate my face, I'm getting older, but this is all I have, this job is all I have. So that was like 14 months before I quit. <laughs> so this is like right after Montreal. Yeah. Right after Montreal, so uh, I'm not doing good. And then in January of 2019, the layoffs happened. Yeah, so if you don't know, in January 2019, BuzzFeed laid off a large amount of people. And it was like very disruptive. Yeah. Like it was super, honestly, I think it was permanently disruptive to the company uh, culture and morale. Yeah. yeah, like I think, I don't think the company culture and morale ever recovered from it. A shit ton of like our close friends were laid off, like a shit ton of people we really care about were laid off. I already was like barely hanging on and then that happened. And then it was like, obviously I still had a job, so I was lucky. Yeah. I would say that psychologically that kind of messed with me a little bit because it was like, I- <laughs> You can feel like you're like, I'm lucky. I still have a job. I should be grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm in a better place than a lot of my friends. Like I need to like get over all of my negative feelings and yes. I need to just perform because it's like, yes. it, me being upset is not worth anything right and, now. And disrespectful to the fact that so many people are struggling right now. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of the vibe that some of the leaders had anyway, so. It was easy for us to internalize it. Yeah. Because like, obviously we had like so much empathy for our friends, so like we were already feeling it and people above us were like, you're right, you should feel that way. <laughs> not only are you in this like never ending cycle of peeling out your body and putting it on the internet, you need to feel grateful about it because your friends are suffering. Yeah. 
and complaining about the job you have that is a privilege to have yeah. is an asshole thing to do. Yeah. And then that spring, a lot of stuff happened that we can't talk about in this video. Yeah. <laughs> but I can briefly, briefly summarize it by saying shit got worse. Yeah. <laughs> Much worse. Much worse. So then summer rolls around. I would say May 2019. Yeah. I was actually in my therapist's office and she very seriously sat me down and was like, you have to take a month off. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was around the time when we were we were pitching empty suitcase. Yeah, I'll I start. can't take a month off. Like I have, I have to make a TV show in in the second half of this year. Like what? And she said to me, if you don't take a month off voluntarily, there may come a point very very soon where you will not have a choice. You may reach a breaking point where you may have to be hospitalized. I'm worried that you are reaching the point where you're going to have like a psychotic break. Yeah. And that's something she's never said to me before in the 12 years I've known her. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> you were like, what? no. No. I was like, I just need to work harder. I've been working my whole life to have my own show, The Empty Suitcase Show, and I finally got it. So now I just got to keep working. And then when I finally get that show, it will, it'll happen. Lucy will not pull the football out from underneath me this time. This is all stuff I've said in my head. To my therapist, I just was like, well, I'm gonna talk to HR about it, we'll see. I went to HR and I was just like, I need to take a month off. And she was just like, let's, sure, let's let's find a way to like make it happen. I think like, you know, cause I had a ton of PTO yeah. and they were just like, we can, we can figure this out. We can figure out a way to make it happen. But then that HR rep left yeah. because she was sick of it. <laughs> And then Empty Suitcase got bought and it was like, well, <laughs> I did not take the month off. It did not happen. Yeah. Obviously like the team, the Empty Suitcase team is incredible. Like there's so many amazing people that worked on it and we love them and you love yeah, them. Absolutely. But yeah, you, you were like, I'm not taking the month off. I am gonna just work, work, work this summer. So we were trying to pre-pro episodes in Europe and obviously we're on the West Coast of the United States and Europe is not there. So what was happening was I was waking up at 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. every morning to try and like email and contact uh, social media reps for different stores. Because if I didn't talk to them at that time, I wouldn't get a response for a whole day. Keep in mind, well, you're not sleeping and you're making all these calls and you're running around. That also was not your main job. Because oh yeah, I the channel worked. had to be run. So basically it was like, you were pre proing the show and at the same time it was like, hey, you basically, we still gotta film, gotta give notes, gotta like, have all these ideas for this channel that's going on in the background and you were not really sleeping and the channel was just like this thing that's going to keep running and running and running mm -hmm. ad nauseum and the amount of help we have is like set. Over the course of like however many years I was making videos there, I gave all of myself to BuzzFeed. I talked about extremely intimate things. Yeah. that I don't own. I cried on camera. I talked about my fears on camera. I got a fucking bikini wax on camera. Sometimes people would mention to me facts about myself and I would be like, how do you know that? And then I realized that we'd made a video about it and I'd forgotten about it. Yeah. My whole body and my experiences and myself were real estate for content that I gave willingly because the idea was that eventually there would be some like, I don't know, goal. reward. Reward, yeah, yeah. Like it, or, that it would mean. Or it would mean something. Yeah, like. It would mean something. The other thing that I want to mention is that BuzzFeed is a very collaborative environment. Every time you see someone succeed, all your major franchises, all your major shows, these are made by multiple people. Yeah. Not one person can claim credit for any one single thing that comes out of BuzzFeed. Lady like was like, all of us making videos, but like we had a team of researchers, we had a team of editors, like we had people that worked really hard mm -hmm. to make stuff and to make it good. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that like we were feeling and a lot of the frustrations weren't coming from the people on our team. Like the other collaborators we had, mm -hmm. we weren't feeling bad because of them. And a lot of them were feeling awful because they were stretched super thin mm -hmm. because they were working with other teams. Yeah. I think Ladylike is actually a good example of this because it's like, you know the person who came up with the name Ladylike? Ashley Perez, someone who literally isn't even in Ladylike. Yeah. So like, that's the kind of place that BuzzFeed is. It's the place where like, you work together in a team to achieve a common goal. 
But the idea is that you also will be looked out for by your team if bad things start to happen. And I don't think that part of the social contract within the culture is being honored. And that's not to say it's not being honored by people on our level. It's not being honored by people that have power at the company. Fast forward to fall 2019. Fall 2019, we're filming empty suitcase. Yeah. I get through the first four episodes, which were Seattle, Philadelphia, Charleston, and Tampa. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm, but I'm like, but I'm kind of like going on adrenaline. It's like, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And then I had a Disney World trip that was planned in the middle of it, which had been planned a long time ago. We yeah. actually planned the season around that trip because it was the only time we could film it. I literally went from Tampa to Orlando, started my vacation, and then had a fun vacation for like, I want to say two days. Yeah. And then on day three, I woke up and I left the hotel room and I, my body fell apart. I was dizzy, I couldn't stand up, I couldn't breathe, I was nauseous, I couldn't, I, I wanted to be on the ground. I thought, I thought I was dying. And from then on in, for the rest of our time, every time we left the hotel room, it happened again. I went to the emergency room when I was in Orlando and they were like, nothing is wrong with you. You're fine, it's, it's literally just anxiety. And I'm like, but I'm not anxious. My body is just mad. I feel fine. Why is my body acting like we're in an emergency? The problem is I was so used to saying out loud, I feel fine and ignoring the fact that like, I physically wasn't feeling fine. And then we got to the second leg of empty suitcase, yeah. which was hard. It got to the point where I was afraid to leave the hotel room. Like, You're having panic attacks. I was having panic attacks. I was praying. I was like, please let me be able to stand up, please let me be able to talk, please let me be able to get through this. Like we are so far from home, I don't know what to do. It was bad in DC, it was a little, it got maybe a little bit better in London, but it was still not great. By the time we got to Greece, it was bad. The Greece episode was probably like one of my lowest points. Yeah. Because like, in between takes on that episode, like I'm literally either on the ground, in the bathroom, or someone is holding me up. The crazy thing about all of this is like, as badly as you were doing, like mentally and physically, that's probably one of the best episodes of Empty Suitcase. So annoying. Because you're a guy, <laughs> it's like, it is. It's, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like, you can't hide that shine. God love Erica. Who was our, produ our, who's our, our producer. Line, who was yeah. our line producer, who literally was just like, how can I get you through this? How can I get you through yeah. this? And it wasn't that like, I mentally wasn't there. I was mentally fine. I would leave the hotel room and I would be like dizzy, nauseous, heartbeat, panic attack, physically. Like, yeah. I feel like I was having like just a heart attack, even though I wasn't. And like, we would do takes where I would be like, jokes, 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 jokes. And the second we cut, it would be like, I'm on the ground. Yeah. I remember like sitting in that bathroom in like the store. In the store and being like, I'm gonna have to get airlifted out of this country. Like I'm dying. Like this is not, this can't just be in my mind. It, I've never felt like that in my entire life. And it was even scarier to feel like that when I was like far away from home. We finally kind of figured it out in Scotland. I figured out that if I took like a Xanax basically every day, I would be able to like function. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be able to like get through it. The only person who was in charge of us during all of this, who at any point looked at the situation objectively and was like, Kristen is gonna die, was like our boss at the time. Yeah. She came to Philadelphia and she was, she looked, she, she surveyed the situation and was just like, this is not sustainable. And I, at the time was just like, we're gonna be fine. Because honestly, in my heart, I knew the only way to make it better was to like, you know, get more resources and like the, sh the ship had sailed. There was like a time crunch. There were all these, these deadlines you had to hit. You couldn't like take breaks. Basically, if you didn't, if you didn't like hit the show on the deadline the show needed to be made, the show wouldn't get made. It's my dream to have a travel fashion show. I was living my dream, but I also was like not able to stand up. I got back and it didn't go away. Yeah. Um, in fact, it got worse. Yeah. I didn't leave my apartment for like a month. Yeah. And this was before all this happened. Before quarantine. Before quarantine. A very funny joke for me. <laughs> just, you know, I, uh, because I was terrified. I was terrified. Every time I would like get ready to leave or I'd walk down the hallway of our apartment, I'd just be like, I can't do this. I'm going to die. Like a rubber band had snapped in my brain yeah. and wasn't fixable. Yeah. And the thing is, is that like, BuzzFeed was a company that I was willing to walk into hell for. Their response to that was like, oh, can you pick up a couple of things for us while you're there? 
I cared about my show and I cared about my team, but the people above, way above, no one was looking out to see. They let me seriously hurt myself. Yeah. They did. There's nothing, I mean, I wish I could gloss around it and be like, this didn't happen, but this did happen. No one was watching. No one was paying attention. Even if someone had really been paying attention to that, there was nothing they could do because- They were overworked. They, because they were overworked and culture is set at the top and the culture is you fucking do it and you don't complain. And because if you do complain, there are other people who wish they had this job. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that broke my heart the most is that I was on a, you know, BuzzFeed is a team. And I realize this is naive of me to say, but I thought that the big team that was BuzzFeed cared enough about me not to let me hurt myself. And I realized that that wasn't true. Yeah. This is a really long story way of saying that like, I knew that it, my time at BuzzFeed was probably coming to a close around the middle of 2019, but I didn't know, like I literally had to quit Honestly, it felt like to save my life. Yeah. Cause it just, I wasn't like a person anymore. I don't think I really, really got to the point where I was like recovered and like able to like leave the apartment without being like stressed out until I want to say like end of January. I think it took me two months. And even yeah. then it was like drugs were involved. Drugs were introduced. Uh, therapy was, was, was intensified. I'm doing better now. Like I'm, I'm obviously able to like leave my apartment. Not that anyone's leaving. Not that apartment. anyone can, but, <laughs> but if you could, by George, you'd be out there. I'd be out there. I know. Literally, as soon as I kind of started getting better, it was like go back in. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't want anyone else to go through what I went through, and if saying what I went through keeps someone else from suffering, then it was worth it. But also, at the bare minimum. Finally saying how I was suffering relieves some of my suffering. So this feels cathartic to me to finally say, this is what was happening to me. Because I think if you look at all these videos and I'm like, I'm happy. Hi, I'm Kristen. What's up? Boop, 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 boop. If you touch your boobs, no one will pay attention to your feelings. I think that like it's important for people to know that like at the same time, I was really struggling. I literally every day I would wake up and I would be like, I really wish I hadn't woken up today. It was like, I have to get in front of a camera and I have to like give a little bit of myself away to a company that I don't think really likes me that much. I think that like sometimes not everyone feels catharsis from talking about things like this and not everyone um, you know, necessarily is ready to talk about things like this. But I know that for me, I'm ready because I think that like now talking about it, I can like move forward with my life and I can make cool things and be the person that I want to be. And so you want to talk about your story? Yeah. I got hired at BuzzFeed when I was 21 and I was like fresh out of college. It was my first job. And like, I was just really excited to be there. Like I, I was really, really happy and really, really grateful that I got hired. Like I loved the friends I was making. I loved the work I was doing and I, it just felt really exciting. And obviously like as time passed, a lot of that like youthful enthusiasm and like desire to please, uh, it just kind of like dissipated and kind of like disintegrated. A lot of that kind of came from the fact that when you have a culture, a company culture that is like this weird mix of like, we're a family, we're friends and everybody's helping everybody. And at the same time is also very like bottom line dependent and, and very cutthroat in certain ways. It kind of just creates really bad boundaries. This is a really good way of putting it. As time passed at Buzzfeed, the pervasive feeling I got was that in order to succeed, I would have to like give more of myself and like work harder constantly. And what kind of became clear was that that wasn't really necessarily going to lead anywhere. You're throwing yourself into this well and you're like, you're gonna hit water. And when you hit water, you're gonna be fine. But what you kind of, what I kind of realized is that the well's just never ending. Yeah. So you're just constantly falling. There would be people in power that would like tell us, you're doing great, we love your work, we love what you're doing. And then there would be people in power that would be like, I don't really see the value in this. It's not really like hitting its goals. It just feels like all the work you're doing is never gonna be enough. But at the same time, maybe it's enough. Maybe if you just keep on trying. If you just rip everything out of yourself and throw it up there, maybe at some point 
you know? Yeah, like I felt I was putting myself forward because I was like, I care about this brand and like the people who make decisions and have power, like they see that and they care too. The company culture is already not great. Combine the fact that like, you know, we live in a racist, sexist society. So that sort of adds to like pressures you feel in a workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, as time passed, I just got really depressed, I guess. I just felt really, really, really increasingly depressed. Mm -hmm. And I just, I felt really shitty because I felt like I was like not performing well. I felt like there wasn't really a point to the work I was doing. I felt like I was ungrateful. I felt like I was letting my team down. One of my big things that I felt was that I just felt like I was becoming a worse person because I felt like I was becoming a really bitter, angry person. And I felt like I had a lot of resentment towards everybody around me. And I felt like that was like, making me lean into these really selfish, shitty impulses. There's still this like part of me that is like very much like, if you had just done more, it would have worked. But it's like- That's kind of the message you get though. You just need to do a little bit more and then it will be fine. But the problem is, is that we kept doing a little bit more and it wasn't fine. Yeah. And it was like, how many times are you gonna yank the football out from underneath us? Yeah. I left because of a lot of things that I can't talk about but I also left because I was really depressed and I felt like I was working at a company that didn't really value me, but would be happy to like have us keep working there as long as we were okay with this like unspoken, but sometimes spoken thing, which is like, you can keep working here and we'll keep paying you obviously, but you're not gonna advance at all. But if, if you want to keep working really, really, really hard for, not, for, 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 things diminishing, to, for, returns. for diminishing returns, yeah. that's cool. Back when we were starting a channel, there were people that had said to me, you know, I don't know if this is a good idea because you're not gonna own it. Again, like you think I'm gonna be different. And you know, I was uh, 22 and I had a shit ton of student loan debt. And I was sort of like, I wanna work in a place that is stable. And the people that have power say they believe in me. And so I just know that if I keep working, like, you know, I'll, I'll get promoted or I'll keep rising and things will be good. Another thing that I wrestle with as I talk about this is the fact that I still feel like I was and am in a very privileged position. And so I was struggling a lot with like feeling like, okay, like, yes, like there are some things about this job that suck, but also like I have health insurance, I'm getting paid okay. Like I have friends that I get to work with every day. And, and so even now, like, like talking about it can be difficult because I just, I don't want to make it, it seem like I wasn't wrestling with those things or that they didn't matter because they did. It's just like by the end of our time at Buzzfeed, like every time I felt I filmed the video, I just felt like shit. I was like, I'm just a fake fraud little bitch. You know, I was like, this doesn't matter. Like people don't like this content. Our viewers don't like it. Like, our, you know, our views were going down because we were burned out and a lot of the videos we were making that just weren't connecting with the audience as much. So I was like, I'm making shit that no one cares about. I feel like I'm a shithead. I'm an ungrateful little bitch for feeling this way at all because I still have a job. So I'm just a bitch, dumb idiot. I was really depressed. Again, I'm on antidepressants now and I'm doing great. Uh, I should have been on antidepressants a while ago. Take your meds, everybody. I love meds. Take your meds. I love Prozac. And again, like I have pretty severe ADHD. And so that combined with the depression just made everything worse because I felt like I wasn't performing at my job and that was getting reinforced by the message you were getting from company leadership. So it just kind of was like, you're not doing great at your job. And when your job is like, part of your job is you being yourself on, on camera. It's like, well, you, when you're not doing great at your job, it's because you are a failure, you suck. Like people don't like you. you, you are terrible. And it's like, that's not really how YouTube works. Like you can be a great person and your YouTube videos can just not do well. Right. And that's, and that's just like, and you can suck and they can be great. Vice versa, yeah. yeah. vice versa. <laughs> you know, it's not like, it's not, it's not about how good of a person you are, but that's, yeah. that's what it can feel like. So I left because I was like, hey, I'm really depressed and I need to get out of here. And also there are other things I wanna do, you know? Like, so I was like, I'm gonna focus on, you know, writing. I wanna be a screenwriter. So I'm gonna work on my pilots. And then I was like, hey, I also like wanna like keep working with my friends. So like, we're gonna try and figure out, like we'll make a channel and we'll, you know, then the pandemic happened, but we were like, we're gonna make a channel. That'd be great. That'll um, be a different video. We're gonna launch it in April, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> LOL. That was our original plan. It was like yeah. April 15th, tax day. Yeah. That didn't happen. I also didn't pay my taxes that day either. <laughs> they got extended though, so that's it's fine. Good fine. You know, there's always going to be people who hear that you were that you had a bad experience at a company, and their response is, "Companies are all about their profit and their bottom line, and if things don't go right, or if you give too much, or you feel like you're, you were maybe taking advantage of, or like things were not going right, then 
that's your fault and that you're, it's your fault for giving too much and for not getting yourself out. And to those people, I just kind of say like, yeah, that you're free to feel that way and believe that way. But like at the same time, it's like, I just believe that we owe each other a little bit more than that. Maybe in like the most like capitalism type of way, you can look at our situation or maybe just in the coldest possible way, you can look at our situation and be like, you guys were getting paid, you got health insurance, and that is what you were promised. And, and so for you to complain, what are you complaining about? I think that on the one hand, yes, we live in a society where you gotta work and this is the work we do and you get paid and that's how it works. People have it worse, it's true. Yeah. And I think that we carry that guilt with us all the time. But I also know that like, I am a fat queer woman. We check boxes. And when we check boxes, we are, benef we are a benefit to a company. I think the quiet part loud was that like, the company, I think sometimes like took credit for being like, look, we have these women, these diverse women working for us and thriving under us, right? Like there was some mm -hmm. clout that came with having people like us working for them, right? Yeah, and because people like us don't typically succeed in, exactly. in media. So the story of like why I left BuzzFeed, why Kristen left BuzzFeed, like, there's gaps in it just because there's some stuff that we can't really talk about. But I hope that it like painted kind of a picture of what was going on. And like also again, we're making this channel because we do like making content and we like making videos and we're excited to like put stuff out there. I think we realized how much we like, we like making videos again. Yeah, but we just like making them when it's like we own them and like we get a, we're directly responsible. It's on our terms. It's on our terms. I'm just glad that Prozac is <laughs> is existing. Cause I really, I gotta tell you guys, I was so depressed. I, and depressed. I, I was just like, I was just not doing well. I hadn't had suicidal ideation to the degree that I was having it since I was like in high school. I think also that was why I was like, well, I'm not in high school, so it can't be that bad. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I'm not closeted anymore. Exactly. So I've gotta be, I'm a lesbian, I'm fine. No, Can I, a lesbian be depressed? No. Impossible. Only a straight lesbian in high school can be depressed. <laughs> like I just like didn't really recognize what was going on. Fast forward to now, I'm still a lesbian. Oh. But I am on Prozac. <laughs> uh -huh. And I am a lot less, I'm doing better. Mm -hmm. And so are you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's that's why we left our old company. And after this, I don't really want to talk about it ever again. Yeah, no, I'm serious. Uh, we, I, I would say that there's a specific ladylike story that'll probably happen later that will be less about our specific experiences and more about like the world, everything that happened. But honestly, this this is meant to be the last time that we talk about this. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. I know that I have been so happy making videos with you, and I think a lot of it is because we just aren't thinking or talking about BuzzFeed. <laughs> yeah. Like, listen, guys, you know, here's the thing. Like, we don't want to talk about it, but like, click on the video, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I suffered and I hurt a lot, and I was in pain and I cried and I wanted to die, and like, I, I didn't know if I was gonna live. And I should make money off of that, frankly. <laughs> listen, I did the work of suffering. I'm the one who should benefit from that. Obviously BuzzFeed gave me incredible opportunities. Obviously you know who I am because of BuzzFeed. I had good memories at BuzzFeed. I liked yeah. working there. For, I was there for five years. Like I liked working there you for- have great memories. Yeah. And like, again, I'm not saying everybody's evil. I'm not saying, you know, pitchforks. I just am saying like, you know, yeah, by the end of our time there, we did not have- Wanted to pitchfork ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I think we were both, I, I was I was pretty actively, I was pretty actively like suicidal by the end. Yeah. What I'm like grateful for is like, I'm grateful that there were like some amazing people there that I learned a lot from. Yeah. And I want them to be successful. And there are some amazing people that are still there and I oh, want yeah. them to be successful. You should support them. You should support them. And yeah, just like, you know, support us too if you want. Please support. Please, please, please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please laugh. Please clap. Please. Please. <laughs> we need to keep affording our Prozac. <laughs> hey. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. I do have health insurance. Everything's good. Um, don't worry about us. We're obviously really grateful that you followed us here. We're, yeah. we're super excited to make stuff for you. I honestly think that taking an unintentional six or seven month hiatus actually was like the best thing that could have happened to yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. I feel excited to make stuff again. Yeah. And I feel like I didn't feel that way, so. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's the story. We love you. We're gonna go eat lunch. We're gonna go eat lunch, and then we're never gonna talk about this again. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about this again. But uh, thank you <laughs> for listening. Subscribe. Kisses. 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 Take your meds, kids. Take your meds. Kiss your meds. Kissy kissy. Kissy kissy.